Pastor Praveen, Pastor Shane, thank you for the invite to be here uh, this morning. It is such an honor uh, to be here with you, and uh, the booths look amazing uh, that are out there. Um, I want to encourage you to visit all of them. There is this really special one out there called Ascent College that I happen to be associated with, and I would never use this as a bully pulpit to influence you, right, to go, no, seriously, go to all of the booths that are out there. We're honored to be a part of, um, of one of them. <clears throat> you know, there's been uh, uh, some mention already about uh, the children, what they're doing uh, right now. Can we, pr- can we pray for them right now? Let's just do that. God, in Jesus' name, we lift up to you. I extend my hand that direction. Others are going to do the same, God, as they are hearing the same call to missions. They're, they're hearing and, and beginning to stir in their little hearts. There's young girls and young boys right now. They're going to look back at this day as a, as a time where you begin to stir within them this desire for missions. We pray for Pastor Lisa, her entire team, uh, God, as they speak into the lives of these uh, young people. And I ask that you would ordain powerful conversations between parents and kids this afternoon, Lord, uh, about this day in Jesus' name. And everyone said together, amen. Uh, amen. A few uh, years ago, I was asking uh, someone who's very involved with world missions within our larger network of Assemblies of God churches, I asked him this question. I said, what do you see as the greatest barrier to this young generation coming up and uh, going into missions? And he said, oh, well, that's easy. Christian parents. And I said, he must, he must have misunderstood the question. <laughs> he said, no, it's Christian parents. They, they pray that everyone else's kid will be called into missions, but not their own. And we had small kids at the time, uh, Jen and I, and I thought, how could you do that as a parent? You know, you raised, until last summer, when Jen and I sat and watched our daughter, Avery, walk off with a backpack that looked like it was going to pull her over as she headed to Honduras. And I realized there is courage that is needed by Christian parents to say, God, they're really yours. They're really yours. And listen, it is hard, right? Because you want safety and all of those things. But maybe we can just all form a support group together for that. How's that sound, right? And let's not be Christian parents that are a barrier uh, to our children. Well, this morning is local uh, missions. And this has been a little bit of an emotional week for me because I've taken time to reflect. I spent the first 35 years of my life here um, all of the time, just growing up uh, and then being on staff uh, here. And so I have been looking back and thinking, how has the missions initiative and movement of West End impacted my life? And and I've always known uh, that it impacts my life. But you know, when you have a week like this, Pastor Shane, you just think about that. And I uh, started thinking about scripture verses early on that um, just became a part of this place, and it, and it still is, as you go into this world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 8, you will receive power from on high to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the othermost parts of the world, and on and on these verses and these emphasis to go. And so in 1984, when I was four years old, I went to uh, the country of Belize down in Central America. Uh, We painted a church, our youth uh, mission trip, and we got to visit this little village that we were just hearing about called Red Bank, right? So we got to go up and see the early fruits of what was happening um, in the work uh, that is there. I remember years later, uh, Jen, uh, my wife Jen had a colleague at work. Uh, they were heading on 
a um, resort vacation to Belize, and it was the first time I thought of Belize as a place people go for resorts, right? It was that. It was like, no, that is missions. And then in 1987, three years later, I was 17 years old, went to Belize. Uh, we had a, had a great ministry there, a youth group, and um, we were in Dangriga, Belize with missionaries that some of you might remember, Loris and Joyce uh, Johnson. Uh, we got to the end of the trip and he said, if you guys would like to go up on the roof of our house and reflect on the trip, uh, you can do that. And so, I mean, what teenager doesn't want to get on the roof of a house, right? And so we climbed up there and we're um, singing and we're reflecting on what God had done on that trip. And it is in that moment, I can still go back to that moment, sitting to beautiful Caribbean sky and there was complete clarity. There was complete calling to go into uh, ministry. My life today, where I am on that rooftop, I, I came down and really have never uh, looked back, deeply impacted. And I want to say um, this to, and I don't know what the right um, description is these days, teenager, next gen, student, it's probably something else, but you get, you know, 12 to 19-ish, 20 um, there are a lot of voices in this world that are speaking destruction over your life and harm, and they're trying to convince you of a lot of things, a lot of deception. Would, would you hear this church family's voice speaking God's wisdom to you? Your heavenly Father loves you deeply. You don't grow up older to discover that. He has, if you would open your heart to him on this day, he will begin to stir purposes and adventures and plans for you that you can't even imagine. You can't even imagine. And I speak from my own testimony uh, when I was uh, 17. Let me get a little sip of water here. Well, I'm not going to track through every mission trip that I was a part of, but multiple ones over the last 30 years, both here at Westin, globally, locally. But in 2013, I found myself in Istanbul, Turkey, with Peyton and Clover Harris, homegrown uh, missionaries here. And Peyton and I were doing a prayer walk around this neighborhood and we were sitting on a bench and I remember it so clearly. I was sitting there and I thought, how did he and I, these guys that graduated from Freeman High School at this church in Weston and Richmond, how did we end up in Istanbul, Turkey? How did we get to this point? Well, we know that it's God, right? But how many of you know that God uses people, right, to provide leadership and inspiration. And this week, I was just so reminded how in the late 1970s, Pastor John Hirschman and his wife, Helen, be set in motion through their leadership, through their passion, through their direction, what has impacted thousands and thousands of lives. It's why we are here today, and the leadership here continues in that. And, and um, they're, they're not going to like that I'm going to do this, but I have the mic. So I can do it. With John and Helen, I don't know where you are, can't see anything, but if you could stand and could we honor this couple for what was set in motion back in the late 90s? And would you do that? Just stand right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. My life has never been the same, and many of yours and the team that they have raised up, and it was Roy Armstrong and then Cindy and now Pastor Praveen and many others. And uh, so that leads me to the title of my message this morning, which might be a mystery to you, but it's entitled Roy Over Richmond. Roy Over Richmond. Uh, that's not a misprint. Um, let me explain to you, and, and it's going to get at the essence of my main point uh, today. Years ago, when uh, Roy was the director of 
uh, missions here, there was a great local project that was going to be the coming together of God's people within Richmond and other churches uh, involved and churches over Richmond. And then I think it got actually named Christ over Richmond and Roy got heavily uh, involved in this. Um, and then um, have you ever started a project with a whole group of Christian people and slowly over time, there's not as many Christian people there anymore helping to finish the project? Has this ever happened to anyone else? This literally came down at the very end to just Roy, all right? So God was present with Roy. God never leaves us or forsakes us. But how many of you know people will, right? Even well-intending people. So I don't know who coined the phrase, but we began starting to calling it Roy over Richmond. Not that he was replacing Jesus, but he was the sole representative of Jesus that was there uh, to finish this. And I can remember asking him, you know, Roy, how's it going? And if you know Roy, he, he said, it's killing me. It's killing me, man, is what he would, would say, you know, but we're going to do it. We're going we're gonna to finish it. And he did. He, he stuck to the very end and finished this house that was being renovated. And, and we just don't know um, the lives that were touched in that home. And, and I know that there had to be frustrations for him in this local uh, project. But here is what I want you to really get this morning. Listen to this statement. At that time, Roy had no idea that his obedience would lead to a sermon 30 years later that might very well inspire hundreds of people to go and do the same. Can you say amen to that, right? And it couldn't do that. You see, that's the power and the rippling effect of obedience. But this message this morning isn't about Roy over Richmond. It is about Jesus through you and this church over Richmond. And so what I want to press into your hearts, what the kind of the big idea that I have here today is this. There are, quote, over Richmond moments that God has for you that will set in motion more than you could ever think or imagine. And someone ought to say amen at that because that's good news. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. And then in Ephesians 3, Paul goes on to say, and God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us to him. Not to you, not to this church, not to Roy, not to any of that God uses people, but to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. In the series you have been in here with Pastor Shane, you were made for so much more. Can I get you to believe it this morning? Can I get you to push through frustration when you thought you started with a group of people and it's now just you and Jesus, right? Can I get you to trust that what you're setting in motion, most likely you won't see most of the rippling fruit and effect of that, but to believe and trust that, that God is cultivating that, that he is doing all of that. You know, whenever we have emphasis of missions like this, um, there's always two dangers that I think of in my mind. The first is that people that are already serving, they're, they're focused, they're all in, um, they heap more shame on themselves and say, I have to do more. I'm not doing enough. They get all of this, you know, conviction rather than affirmation. And then folks that have somehow either discounted themselves or they've chosen to be inactive into this point, assume that it's for somebody else and not for them. Listen, in the New Testament, there is no outsourcing of mission to other people. It's called the priesthood of all believers. It's that Jesus, forgive the phrase, but takes knuckleheads like you and me, every one of us, and says, if you're willing, I have some moments of mission for you. And to keep in line with the theme for this morning over Richmond. 
So how do we do that? That's inspiring, right? We're excited that Roy did that and, and we encourage and celebrate that, but, but how do we move forward and, and say, I, I, want to, I, I want that. I want so much more. I, I want mission in my life. And so what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list four what I'm calling exhortations. Now, we don't use that word very much. It's a great biblical word. It's used quite a bit in the book of Hebrews. And exhortation is simply this. It's stronger than a suggestion, but it's not quite a command. It's not an order, all right? It's like a strong suggestion. It's kind of what happens when you start to parent young adult children, right? You know, it used to be, don't touch, it's command, right? Now it's um, sort of like, you know, I would highly recommend you not touching that because you go, huh, it's, it's that, okay? It's, it's exhorting, all right? And so this morning, I, I want to exhort this. It's, it's kind of this strong urging for each of us. And if we will do these four things. They, they will equip us to do the local mission and outreach that God has called you uh, to do. And you know, all four of these might apply to you. One might stand out more than the other. We're going to respond at the end to whatever God is touching your heart uh, about. So here's exhortation number one. Let us, first of all, refresh our love of the gospel. You might say, well, I knew that before I came to church, right? Refresh our love of the gospel. Let me illustrate it to you this way. God refreshed my love of the gospel on a bus full of children who lived in Creighton Court. It was some years ago, and we were part of a ministry. We'd go and uh, pick up kids and bring them back to church, and uh, there was feeding ministry and teaching. There were all kinds of things that we did. And this one day, um, I was on the Creighton Court bus, and I sat in the back. You know, that's where sometimes the crazy kids, you know, it, nothing's changed in like 50 years, has it, you know? Like, I want to just somehow go to the back of the bus, you know? They did that when I was growing up. So I went back, and I sat, and there were these three boys there. They're probably age eight or nine years old, and I decided to sit in um, front of them, and uh, two of them were playing some games uh, on their phone. There was one boy that was sitting in the middle, and, and I kind of was sitting half looking forward, half looking back, so I wouldn't get m motion sickness, to be honest with you, the back of the bus. And uh, the boy that was sitting in the middle, he, uh, he said to me, uh, Pastor Rob, my uncle died this week. And uh, my mom told me, and, and he was really like my father figure is what he said. He was like a father to me. He didn't say father figure. He was, like a, he was a father to me. But my mom told me that he had Jesus in his heart and he's in a place called heaven. Can you, can you tell me about that? I mean, can God tee it up anymore, right? I mean, it's like, am I making this up? You know, what's going on here? And, and so I said, oh, well, first of all, I'm so sorry that, that your uncle died. And I'm so happy they had Jesus in his heart. And, and I was beginning to say a few things about heaven, but I noticed that the other two boys, um, were still playing their games. They weren't looking up and that occasionally this kid in the middle would look at them. And I thought to myself that they're probably bored with what I'm saying. And so I changed the subject. I said, hey, hey, uh, what games did you get for Christmas? And they told me, and I acted like I knew what it was. I had no idea what it was. And, and then I tried to find other things to, to make conversation with and that sort of thing. And all of a sudden, after about two minutes of doing this, the boy in the middle, he looks at me and he says this, and I will never forget his words. He said, Pastor Rob, will you stop talking about games and tell me more about heaven? I got saved all over again on the back of that bus. And I almost kicked my water here, but we'll scoot it over. You know, sometimes you and I, you say, do you love the gospel? Yeah, yeah, I love the gospel. 
And then we get out in the world and in our workplace and different settings, and here's what sometimes happens, and it's an indication that it's time to refresh your love of the gospel, is sometimes we can change the subject away from the gospel when no one has asked us to do that yet. It's the good news of the world. It's the greatest message on the planet. It's why Paul said in Romans, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Thanks be to God for his word. I'm telling you, some of you this morning, you just need to refresh your love and the greatest message on the planet and decide, you know what? People are hurting. They, they want to know about heaven. And if they don't, okay, then just move on to the next one, Jesus said, right? But refresh our love. The second exhortation this morning is this, let us revise what we consider gain and what we consider loss. Paul in Philippians said this, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. I have uh, the joy, and it's a long story, I won't get into it, of praying in a barn in Goochland every Wednesday night at 6.30. And I can just, I can tell you, I never thought those words would ever come out of my mouth, right? It's amazing. It's just very grassroots, people that want to come out. There's some folks from Youth with a Mission, Deb Scalsey, who's probably here. She comes out and some um, others. And apparently, and, and, and um, every once in a while, we'll be praying for a missions family. And so for the last few years, we've been praying for a Brazilian family who accepted the call of God into missions. They liquidated and they sold everything and they moved up to the Youth with a Mission base uh, here for some training, and they have spent the last four years in China. They did COVID in China. Yeah, so that trumps your experience, all right, right, right there. I'm not, I'm not downplaying that, just, and, and they've come home now, beautiful family, three kids, I, I think they're like eight, 10, and uh, 12, and as they were entering in, there was a hiccup with the mom's visa, and they sent her away. So the husband and the three kids are here in Richmond. Mom is separated, and they've been coming out to the barn, and we've had the joy of praying with them. And I have been so convicted in my own heart as I see this father with these kids worshiping God and praying when they are wondering, why has God not gotten our mom back to us yet? Because somewhere along the way, they revise what a gain is and what a loss is. And, and we're praying that God is going to miraculously completely reunite this family together. And I hope that you will join with me. Listen to this statement. It's the most important thing I will say this morning. There is not mission without revising what we consider gain and what we consider loss. There isn't. And, and I'm not saying go sell everything and go move to China. It's different for all of us. But if you think that the path to that has no cost, it has no revision to your prioritization, no changing in your thinking or your routine or how you allocate time or anything, mission won't happen because there'll always be something that will get in your way. But you revise what the gain is, see? And it's opposite of the world, isn't it? It's opposite. Well, the third exhortation for us to be having these moments of mission over Richmond is this. Let us repent when we get it wrong. Anyone here perfect? 
If someone raises their hand next to you, if you could call the pastoral team this week of this church. And so good. All right. I'm glad I'm not the only one. And so, you see, I had this kind of theory of why we often outsource mission or somebody else is going to do that is because from time to time, we get it wrong. We make a mistake a couple of times, and you know what we do? We throw in the towel. We say, oh, I'm not cut out for this. Obviously, people that are more spiritual than me, they never make the mistakes that I make, and so I probably am disqualified uh, for that. Listen, Romans chapter 2, verse 4 says, God's kindness leads you towards repentance. Why would it say it? Because we're all at a place where from time to time we need to repent. I, I, I got it wrong, right? You see, repentance is not rejection. It's the opposite. Repentance is acceptance. It's Jesus saying, come on, you're on my team. I know your name and I want you on my team and I cleanse you and I advocate on your behalf. So let's get that pass and let's get busy doing mission because you're the one that's supposed to talk to that person. You're the one that's supposed to pray for that person. You're the one that's supposed to go there. You're the one that's supposed to support that per that that individual or missionary. It's not to be outsourced in your life, but learning to repent and move on is so important. God taught me this lesson when my son Miles was in uh, first or second grade. He woke me up one morning. Some of you have heard me share this before, but it's so impactful on my life. And he was shaking me, dad, 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 dad. And I said, what? And um, he said, hey, on this index card, I have a scripture verse that I memorized. And today in show and tell in school, I'm going to say the scripture verse. And I was tired. I was groggy. Um, he and Avery had just started a brand new uh, school. And, and, and in that moment, I just I had a weak moment of thinking, well, what, what if he does that and he gets teased? Or what if, you know, they call home from school and say, hey, we know you're a preacher, but you can't send your kid quoting scripture in the public school, you know, no proselytize, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I, I, I just said, Miles, why don't you not do that? Why don't you take your new matchbox car or something or whatever? And he's like, all right. And he, he runs off, you know. So I happened to find the card that day that he had. And the scripture verse he had memorized was, as you go into the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I realized in that moment, I did not just instruct my son not to read scripture publicly. I just taught him not to do the Great Commission. And I had to repent. Well, he came home that day, and I decided first thing I'm going to do is tell him, hey, Miles, dad made a huge mistake. We are proud of the gospel. And he came up the steps, you know, and I grab him, and, and I'm like, hey, you know, you memorized this scripture. And I looked at it, and this is such an important scripture. I have no idea why I told you that, that you shouldn't do that. It was, a, it was a mistake. I am so sorry. I've asked forgiveness from the Lord. And he stops me, and he's like, dad, I did it anyways, is what he said. <laughs> Come on for children, right? I said, Miles, that was good disobedience. <laughs> that was good. Maybe this morning you have something to repent from. Not major, and it just, why, why did I miss that moment? And this morning God's spirit is going to say, hey, let's just get it right and, and move on. You have things to do. Well, let's land the plane, so to speak, here this morning. Our final exhortation is let us resource generously. These four things, we will inc incorporate them in our lives. There will be moments over Richmond that, that you will find yourself in the midst of and, and serving. Resource generously. I, I have a few things I want to say about this, but just with the, with the time, I want, to, I want to actually use my closing illustration because I think it will, will best sum this up. There's a, 
a lady that was for years involved uh, here, years involved uh, in missions. Some of you will remember Sonia Wright that uh, was here and uh, continued to serve in uh, missions. And some years ago, I was with her at another ministry, and she wanted to sell her house. And uh, f- for one year, this prayer group, we were praying for her to sell her house because she said, I just believe in my heart that I want my house to be a resource for the kingdom. And, um, you know, we would, she would say, I, I know I need to get money out of it to live off of as I, as I continue to age. But I, I just, even if I need to take a little loss on it or whatever, I, I, would you pray with us for this? And so we would pray and we would pray and we would pray and we would pray and we would pray. And, and then, you know, how you're praying and in the back of your mind, you're just thinking, just sell it, right? And give money to missions. I mean, it's the same thing, but she just had this in her heart. She wanted to resource generously this particular asset that she had. So she came in one day and she said, "Um, there's a contract on my house from a roofer. And we said, really? I mean, did you change your mind? And she said, no, I... I just had the peace of God that it was supposed to be this roofer, and he he made me an offer on the house, and it is less, but I, I just I want him, I just think he should have it. And so I said, great, and, and honestly just forgot about it. Years later, fast forward, I'm serving at Celebration uh, Church. It has a, a ministry for women that are victims in human trafficking that we would um um, law enforcement would bring them to us to care for, have safety. There were many addiction issues. I mean, all, all of the stuff that goes uh, with that. And uh, one day they drove me over to this house. There were about eight women that we were helping at that point in time. And we pull into this particular neighborhood and there's kind of brand new suburban looking homes that are there. And, and all of a sudden, we, we turn in between two of these homes and we weave our way in this driveway and we pull up and I'm like, I, I've been to this house before. And we go inside and I look around and I'm like, this is the house we prayed about. This is, this is Sonia's house. And so I asked them a little bit about, they said, yeah, it was the craziest thing. This roofer, he was there fixing, had addiction issues, got saved, got involved. And this now became our house where we minister to victims of human trafficking. I said, I you know how when something good comes out of prayer years ago, you're real quick to take credit for it, right? You know, hey, I, I, I prayed for this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had the joy of calling Sonia, and I said, are you sitting down? She said, yeah. I said, remember when we prayed for your house There's that year? Guess what's happening to it right now? Women are being rescued from human trafficking. They're experiencing forgiveness and the loss of shame in their life. They're coming to know Jesus and they're building confidence and all of this is going on and they want to meet you. And so we got to take her over to this house that she had prayed in and she would sit and do Bible study with them. That's pretty amazing. Now, the temptation is for you every time you have a roofer to come to your house to think, oh, maybe he's going to get saved or something, you know. But here's why I close with this. And why don't you stand? I know you've been sitting for a while. Why don't you stand? Because I am going to invite you either where you're standing or some of you this morning, the space here at the front will become a space that you make a covenant with God in response. And by the way, I think we're putting, go ahead and put all four points. I want them up there for your reference so that as you respond in just a minute, you know which one you're responding to. But here's what I want you to catch. When your heart says, I want to resource generously because it's important and, and, you, and you say, God, it's, it's all yours. Faith promise is a part of that. 
Your gifts and your talents are a part of that. Other assets that you have are a part of that. It's not about us telling you how to do that or what to do that. But when you get a spirit of generosity, what happens is God does things in his kingdom and you find yourself in places where you're like, unbelievable. I can't believe it. I'm sitting in a house that I prayed would be used for God's purpose. I sold it to um, a roofer, and now I'm sitting ministering to women who are victims of human trafficking. I could have never imagined this. Why? Because he does above all. He does more uh, than we can ever think or imagine, right? He does more than we could ever think or imagine. The words of Isaiah, I say to you, West End, this morning, the spirit of the living God is upon you. The spirit of the living God. And he has anointed you to preach good news to the poor. For you to draw close to the brokenhearted. For, for you to be a part of setting the captives free. For, for you raising up oaks of righteousness for what's called the oil of gladness. That mourning and sorrow will be turned to joy in people's lives. Why? Because the kindness of God draws us there to repentance in our own lives. And then we go forth and that, and that happens. And some of you just need to be refreshed in that this morning. So let's respond for a few minutes before Pastor Shane comes back up and we want to give you time to visit uh, the various um, booths that are out there. God, I, I don't know which part of this message has touched different hearts that are here, but I know there are times in our life where we feel that we should journey to the front, to the altar, because it's not more spiritual up here, but it's an important symbolic moment for us to say, God, I, I've heard you this morning and I'm getting some things right with you here. Others, you just say, I, I, I feel that the Lord wants me to stay right here. Young people and others, doesn't matter what friends think next to you or parents who say, what in the world what is going on with, with him? Listen, this your heavenly father's drawing you. So would you begin to come right now? Not a lot of fanfare, just the music playing softly. God's speaking to you, one of these points, and I'll meet you here at the front. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.